challenge panel uh, where we're going to discuss uh, and delve into the dynamic world of uh, fundraising in the digital era. Uh, we're hoping to explore uh, today insights that will help us uh, not only navigate the intricate landscape of digital fundraising, uh, but also ensure that ethics uh, remain at the heart of what we do. Um, we would also uh, hope to uncover the keys uh, to successful and ethical and impactful fundraising in the uh, digital era. So without further ado, let's uh, commence. And it is my privilege to uh, introduce our panel for this session. Um, Mr. Gerald Oppenheim, a respected figure in the charitable and fundraising sector, chief executive at the fundraising regulator, as well as trustee and deputy chair at the National Emergencies Trust. Uh, Gerald's distinguished career and commitment to various charitable organizations make him a valuable voice in our panel today. We also have Mr. Hassan Imtiazi, a digital marketing veteran with 16 years of experience, a published author, and a visiting lecturer at uh, renowned universities. He is a digital marketing uh, expert known for generating over 70 million in revenue through uh, innovative campaigns. Uh, Hassan has uh, significantly marked the digital landscape of the leading Muslim charities and we are excited uh, to hear uh, both insights today. So, um, Gerald, in your experience, uh, what are the most common challenges organizations face when uh, trying to achieve their fundraising goals uh, while remain, uh, remaining ethical and maintaining trust and transparency? Well, that's, uh, that's, that's quite a question to, uh, to start off with. Um, I think the... The, the overall answer to that, whether you're doing your fundraising digitally or whether you're doing it in perhaps using older technology um, or doing it face to face, is to make sure that you follow the rules that exist, which apply across the whole of the fundraising uh, landscape, um, and that you do it with respect and don't put anybody that you would like to do donate to your cause under the feeling that they're being pressured to do something that perhaps they don't want to do and are being very polite and don't want to say no to you. Don't put them under pressure. Take them with you. And encourage them to, uh, to think about what you're doing you know, as part of their, their own pattern of giving. Perhaps would you like to take us through your uh, presentation, Gerard? Sure. Okay, <laughs> fine. Right, I, I will do that. Um, just stand up to do this because it's slightly easier. Um, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, I'm going to take you through, I hope, uh, lunch and networking. No, I don't think it's that. The it's the other way around. Yeah. It's going the other way again. There we go. Um, I'm going to take you through the, the headlines, really, of what fundraising regulation amounts to. In other words, who we are and what we do, uh, where we do it, and uh, some of the key things that we're doing at the moment. I think these slides are available to everyone afterwards, so don't feel you have to take notes, because I think I've only got about 10 minutes to, uh, to do this, so it'll be a bit of a gallop. Who we are... Um, we're the independent regulator of charitable fundraising in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. We were set up in the early days of 2016, so we're not a, an old organisation by any means, very young, seven and a bit years old. And we were set up because in 2015 there were a lot of problems in charity fundraising uh, very well publicised at the time, uh, deeply damaging to the reputation of charities and damaging to the willingness of members of the public to donate even where they had favourite charities that they'd been giving to for a long time. There were a lot of problems. We were set up on the back of all of that. Our role, as with any regulator, 
whatever they do, is to promote public protection and to make sure that there's accountability in fundraising and indeed that it's excellent. Uh, we obviously are here to build public trust to, to ensure that happens. The way it works, the way we're funded, is through a levy or a charge on the largest fundraising charities, just over 2,000 of them, everything from the big household names that you might recognise through to much smaller but nonetheless fundraising at scale organisations that spend more than £100,000 a year on their fundraising. And we draw that data from the returns that charities have to make every year to the Charity Commission, uh, whether that's the Charity Commission in England and Wales or the one in Northern Ireland. So, uh, and below that, uh, we have a, an annual registration scheme uh, for charities uh, that do fundraise that want to register with us. And if you register with us or you're a levy payer, you get to use our little badge that you can see in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen saying that you're registered with us. And you see that badge with increasing frequency on uh, charity advertising, whether that's on television or on uh, leaflets that may fall out of your newspaper, um, particularly at times of peak uh, fundraising to encourage the public to give, whether that's, for example, at Ramadan or at Christmas, the two sort of big events, I suppose you could say. So our role then is to uh, maintain, to set and maintain fundraising standards. If you've called in at our stall in the exhibition area earlier in the day, you will have seen a little red book sitting on the, the table called the Code of Fundraising Practice. Uh, that sets out the rules, if you like to look at them that way, for good fundraising. Uh, part of that role that we have is also the downside of fundraising to consider complaints about it from usually from members of the public when they feel something hasn't worked as they might have expected. We do expect uh, complainants to try and resolve things with the charity first before they come to us um, so that, uh, you know, that's the best way to get a problem solved, is to get it solved with the people that are most closely affected. So, uh, but we will look at complaints about fundraising from, uh, a, a, by, about any organisation, whether they are a levy payer, whether they're registered with us, or whether they're not registered with us. So our scope is very wide. We have a public directory of organisations that are registered with us, there are now roughly 6,100, so 2,000 or so levy payers and just over 4,000 others. We also have a number of commercial organisations that charities might use to help them with their fundraising registered with us as well. You can find all of that online on our website. Um, we run another service uh, called the Fundraising Preference Service. Uh, again, set up after all the problems in 2015, when there was a lot of marketing of uh, uh, charity uh, data and information to encourage people to give. But a lot of people didn't want it. A lot of people never signed up to it. And arguably, the, when, when, when people were being sent things they didn't want, uh, the law was being broken, the law of data protection was being broken. That's all been tidied up, thank goodness, and colleagues out there from the Information Commissioner played a key role with us in doing that. But if you want to opt out of getting marketing from charities, you can use the fundraising preference service. And we're also here to respond to new issues as they come up. A little bit about uh, how and where we do this. As I've said, England, Wales, Northern Ireland is uh, at the core of what we do. Um, we work closely with uh, another organisation in Scotland that picks up complaints about fundraising by charities that are solely registered and operate north of the border. Um, however, of course, charities registered in England, particularly the big ones, will also fundraise in Scotland and we, we regulate uh, them for doing that. 
and everything hangs on the code of fundraising practice. There are lots of different types of charitable organisation beyond registered charities that have the public good and public benefit in what they do. Some of them don't have to be registered with the Charity Commission. For example, a university in England would not be. Um, but nonetheless, they have the same basis in law. They're for the public good and uh, they have similar attributes to charities. There are others that are like that that, again, I, I won't go into the detail because it's a whole other hour, um, that are charitable, philanthropic and benevolent in what they do. There's the code and it sets, as I've said, it sets the standards for fundraising regulation wherever you are in the United Kingdom. The other important point to remember is that as with everything to do with a charity, whether it's fundraising, whether it's the way you run the services that you provide, the advice you give, the buck stops with trustees. Um, I'm one, so I, I know this well in, a, in another place. You're responsible in law for what happens inside your charity. So it's really, really important that where fundraising is concerned, trustees know what's going on. Uh, they might even do some of that as, as a volunteer fundraiser, but you know what's going on. You're happy that it's happening in the way that you think treats people respectfully and is ethical in the way it's delivered. And it's very important that anybody doing fundraising, whether they're paid members of staff or their volunteers, as they're likely to be in community-based organisations, understand what they're fundraising for and understand the way in which it should be done. And the code is there online to help you do that. There are values that underpin all of that, obvious ones, and a lot of regulators share these. Everything you do has got to be legal. Everything you do should be open so that if you're asking somebody for a donation, they can understand why you're asking them, what you'll use the money for, and that if they ask for more information, you can explain what it's about. It sounds very obvious, but it does go wrong. And you've got to obviously be honest about all of that, to act with integrity at all times and not intentionally mislead people. And as I've said before, you need to be respectful when you're dealing with members of the public, even, you know, in particular, uh, people in your own communities that you might want to approach for a donation. I've mentioned the code. I'll just say very briefly that we are revising it uh, at the moment. It's a complicated document. I wouldn't present, uh, pretend otherwise. It's not the easiest thing. You can't sit down and read it in, in a session. Well, you can try, um, but I don't think people do that. Um, I wouldn't. Uh, it covers lots of different types of fundraising, so fundraising around holding events in the community, fundraising if you're uh, the sort of charity that is able to take advantage of people leaving you a legacy in their will, um, all sorts of fundraising uh, that goes on is covered by the code. The code also references and gives you links to guidance that other regulators publish. The Charity Commission, most obviously, the Information Commissioner, the Advertising Standards Authority, if that's what you're doing to promote your charity, the Gambling Commission, should you be running lotteries or, or anything like that. It's, it's, it covers that very extensively and it also references the law where, the, uh, where charity law has something to say about fundraising. Again, that's a complex subject in its own right, so I will just leave that, that thought with you. But all of this adds up to making sure that, in the spirit of the question I was asked to begin with, what you do whatever fundraising you're doing, whether it's digital in the modern age or 
more established old-fashioned methods is ethical and works. And part of that is making sure, as I've said, that you manage your volunteers. Again, apologies for using a couple of slightly technical terms here. If, a, if you use a volunteer to fundraise for you, they'll be fundraising on your behalf, meaning you will know what you've asked them to do and how you want them to do it. A lot of charities find, though, that a lot of people fundraise in aid of them, and the charity doesn't actually know that's happening until perhaps they get a nice surprise and some money arrives in their bank account. That in aid of fundraising is obviously much more difficult to know about. You can't always control it, and sometimes that's where things can go wrong because uh, somebody decides they want to run fundraise for their favourite charity, they do that, their friends make donations on their uh, online page, and then perhaps some of the money doesn't get through to the charity, and that's where people uh, get concerned quite, quite clearly, and uh, we often have to intervene uh, in that way. So, on behalf of you control it, you know what they're doing, and they should be accountable back to you for the, the work that they do and the money that they raise for you. And managing your volunteers, obviously, uh, essential uh, to that. Um, as I've said, you can uh, register with us. You get our, our badge there on the right of the, the screen. Using the badge shows that you're committed to good fundraising, you're committed to the code, and that you will do everything to make sure that you raise money ethically uh, and treat people in a respectful way. And you can use our badge on your literature, uh, everything that you publish, as many, many charities do. Um, we were asked on the stand uh, quite a lot today, my colleagues who were there, about resources and whether we can help train people in good fundraising. Unfortunately, as a small organisation training, um, people who support 168,000 charities in England and Wales is a little uh, beyond our scope. But that said, there are resources online that will be there to help support all of this, the code. We issue guidance, which we think is written in plain English, um, that goes alongside it, that goes into a bit more detail than the code can do. Um, we do, as I've said, have to investigate when things don't work out as planned. Uh, we publish summaries of our investigations on our website, and the intention there is not to sort of name and shame organisations where things have not happened. They're there to help people learn from it and get their, get their fundraising better. We publish uh, an annual complaints report, which is out in a few weeks' time in early November. Um, which again summarises our experience over the previous year and the experience of uh, just under 60 of the largest fundraising charities in this country um, because our experience and their experience is often quite similar in terms of what people complain about. There are a few webinars on our website and we run an advice service where you can ring up uh, and speak to one of our colleagues in the, the policy team or leave an email uh, uh, for, uh, for help. So it is possible to get that. Um, there's the number on the screen now and, and our, um, our email address for those sorts of inquiries. We publish a monthly newsletter, uh, so you can sign up for that as well, uh, which is a really quite quick and easy way to keep up to date with, with what we're doing and uh, got our social media presence there. So I think that's it from me. I think questions come later yes. at the end. So save any questions you've got while I pass over to Asa. Over there. Thank you so much, Gerald, for sharing uh, that information. The regulation around the regulations, um, ethical guiding ethical fundraising in a landscape where uh, ethics uh, and trust are paramount. Now let's hear from uh, Hassan. Uh, further um, around the uh, digital revolution uh, in fundraising, particularly in a highly digitized uh, post-COVID world. Thank you so much. I'll rather stand. Uh, yes. 
Thank you so much. I've got a pretty broad topic to cover, and it's I made a slide based on my personal experience in working with the charity sector for the last 12, 13 years. I left the sector uh, quite recently, two years now. I'm working for a fast-moving consumer good company, Nestle. And the reason I left it is because I felt monotony what I was doing at that time, and I was quite passionate about technology, so I thought just to kind of move away from it and <clears throat> see how mainstream works uh, in that spectrum. So I'm a bit of a risk taker, you can see here, and that's in me, jumping from the plains and, and, and mountains, and that's what I give from my you know, test and learn approach in the digital. I'm also author of a couple of books, uh, visiting the lecturer at Cass Business School and Reading Business School. So, excitingly, uh, I have witnessed how the digital fundraising and traditional fundraising gone through over the years, and I joined Islamic Relief back in 2008 and 9, and this was the kind of spectrum going on in the mainstream, and this is what we used to do typically within the Muslim Islamic charity sector. For example, we used to do a lot of fundraising dinners, uh, events, post, uh, call centers, calls, television uh, ads, TV appeal, most fundraising, blah, blah, blah. But we didn't realize at that time that mainstream channels are evolving at the same time. That, you know, we have penetration of mobile phones, we got more users coming online and so on and so forth. And this is how I kind of start my own journey, uh, questioning myself how we can reach more people <coughs> online. And that was like talking 2009 and 10. And that's how we kind of start building the relationship with the technology companies, and we managed to raise, you know, millions and millions of pounds for for the food, good causes. So, um, so, so over the period of pre-COVID and post-COVID, things have changed quite drastically. And comes COVID, obviously, everything changed. Uh, you know, we, you can't go outside, you can't fundraise, nothing can happen. It's not only within the charity sector; it's in the mainstream as well. So I kind of thinking that is pretty much the same time period when we used to have like Y2K back, year 2000, where we were thinking, oh, everything will be stand till on, God knows, this, first January of, you know, on like 2000. And millions and millions of pounds was invested, 300 million dollars were invested in technology. Uh, and, you know, nothing happened. People and computer programs figured it out. And, but this time, there is uncertainty, but we are quite, clever enough because we are using technology as a consumer and we shifted quite quickly that you know we're having meetings on the zoom or team etc so so we have been kind of forced to do it uh, but we're kind of ready but again the whole transformation bit was abrupt and people were not ready not ready and, and, and the companies were not ready uh, the other challenge with us is we want to run before even start kind of learning uh, to walk. And this is what's happening with many organizations that we, when we want to go to digital, we do not know the fundamentals to cover it. And this is again very, very basic that you know, how technology enable us to do the next step, etc. We only used to talk about campaign activation and fundraising numbers, etc. cetera. We, we never talk about what are the fundamentals from the digital and technology point of view. And obviously, mainstream world was different. So for example, in 2006, 2006 Clive Humbey, the, the mastermind of Tesco marketing uh, club card, he coined the term, uh, data is the new oil. At that time, he didn't know about data at all. We were talking about like post and call centers, right? And so much so, most of our marketers within the sector cannot really differentiate about first party, second party, zero party, you know, what data all about. And what's going to happen when we don't have cookies to remarket consumer? What will happen from the regulatory point of view uh, that you know will be will be enforced to uh, to do something for opt in? What will happen that Google and Apple decided to do something which will affect our own online marketing? So we we do not know what's going on. So hence we came through digital disruption. And it wasn't like, it wasn't like overnight, uh, it involves, so that means disruption happens when we have a new business models. And within the charity sector, I can see quite a few campaigns uh, where I can see not disruption, but good example of, of campaigns, for example, again, give an example of Islamic Relief, the Cakes for Syria, 
was a small project, it ended up raising millions and millions of pounds. It was a very logistically heavy campaign, but led by uh, uh, volunteers through technology. So you can see all of the companies here, they don't own anything, but they are the biggest and largest. So that's how technology do the magic. And for us as a Muslim charity sector, we need to see what, what are the key enablers, uh, right from the organization to technology to data, ways of working, and again, in the center of that, a consumer or donor. What will happen if we can manage to predict the next best action for the donor? So that means we can optimize our you know, fundraising efforts. And that can be possible through technology. It's not rocket science anymore. And, and I have kind of developed this framework whereby charities can adopt this through ad technology, marketing technology, and web technology. We do have websites, but we don't usually talk about technology behind it. Uh, we normally talk about the user experience improvement. If I ask any of you, have you even thought that improvement of 1% of your conversion rate can lead to half a million pound worth of revenue, just only 1%. How many charities are thinking on those lines? So these are the tools available to enhance the user experience. These are the tools available to integrate everything from offline to online to have a collective or unified donor or customer view. These are the advertising technologies available to make sure you, you buy best of the best inventory and do not waste it. And below that, you have all of these tools, by the way, these are a few examples, to see what is exactly is going on behind the scenes uh, through data and analytics and through visualization of the data. So this is, for me, is a new way, a new model for a modern charity to follow. Advertising and marketing and branding <coughs> and, and activation and fundraising comes anyway. So this is the kind of infrastructure behind the scenes. One case study I'm going to highlight for Islamic Relief, and I was fortunate enough that Google approached us back in 2012 and 15, and they did a couple of cases. But this case study was on the back of uh, Pakistan floods 2010. We did a campaign, and post campaign analysis showed that we managed to raise 450, 15 pounds every second, right? And that was years back. And now you can imagine with the limited technology, with, with the limited data inside at that time, and now, fast forward 2023, what magic can be done? And even the Google and Facebook, they were kind of surprised what's going on behind the scenes and you know who's working it. And they did the case study on the campaign, and obviously it was very integrated campaigns uh, through television and TV channels, uh, fundraising efforts, but creating a demand and leveraging that demand. So that was at that time. Now, Talking about AI, the pretty buzzword nowadays, haven't seen much of the use cases in the charity sector, but again, it can help make efficient in terms of your processes and thought process. But at the end of the day, we humans should take a decision. We need to have a certain judgment behind that. So again, SEO, right from the SEO research or writing ad copies or content generation ideas, image creation, etc. So everything is there. It's us to see what can be done. Uh, for, for our benefit. And last topic, obviously, from this is the question being asked so many times in all those years, that when going to the Google and, and, and doing all of the advertising, spending $100,000, etc., uh, is that really worth bidding uh, you know, on, the, on the other charities? Yes, it is very much legal. It is legal, uh, but in my experience, we shouldn't bid because it, it is, generally speaking, a waste on that. It is a very time-consuming uh, task. Uh, you, will have, you, you won't get result out of it. So this is, again, obviously, I will elaborate furthermore. And key, key, take, key takeaways from my, is, my side is invest in technology and people. And that's something, capabilities, whether it's technological capability or people. In our sector, it's very difficult to find technology-led people because Whatever reason, we don't have enough you know, people around it. Uh, optimize marketing investment, encourage an agile approach. Think twice before start putting your fellow competitor, uh, fellow charities as a, as a competitor, and watch out the trend. So these are the takeaways. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we will wel welcome questions from uh, our audience, so please um, feel free to um, wave at me and I'll come uh, over and uh, give you the mic. Um, so, you know, uh, in the meantime, um, Hassan, do you think that uh, Muslim charities have the capacity and the expertise uh, for effective digital marketing and also do you think that they leverage data um, effectively to engage with their audiences? I think the value is there in terms from the higher management of trustees, the board of director point of view. They obviously, it's been enforced because of the COVID. Uh, in terms of capabilities, I wouldn't say we don't have enough, you know, we don't have capabilities as yet, as I showed you. Um, so I think it's long way to go uh, and I think one of the conversation around is to build a center of excellence within the charity sector whereby we can share insights and learning and see you know how things are moving uh, within this technology space we don't even have a benchmark uh, to, to if, if if my boss come and say okay do you have any benchmark for click to rate or, or return on ad spend we don't even have it if we if we if you see if we do the benchmarking based on the other mainstream charities, so it won't be like you know, a true picture. So I don't think so at present. But there's a will, there's a there's a will. Obviously, there's a will, there's a way, but not at present. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, would you like to? Ask? Is your question for Hassan or for Gerald? For Gerald. Okay. Hi, Gerald. Thank you for your presentation. I think uh, it was wonderful to understand the work of the fundraising uh, regulator. Um, and as you uh, mentioned, um, and I think we all remember who have been in the sector for a while, the issues that, that the sector was facing around 2015, and you know the, uh, and it was a timely uh, that the fundraising regulator got set up. But now that we're in 2023, like, do you still feel that there's a lot of work to do to educate? Uh, organizations out there that the fundraising regulator actually exists you know um, so one of my experiences is you know, so for example I'm from Wales and I think that there's been very limited interaction with with the community by the regulator and the role and, and the vital role that that it plays along with the charity commission uh, to obviously um, strengthen uh, the sector thank you uh, th thanks. Thanks for the question. That's a really, really good um, question to ask about outreach and, and what people know about us. Um, before everything came to a, a full stop in, in early 2020 for a couple of years, we had actually put in place, uh, certainly if I take Wales as the example, uh, a number of, uh, I suppose you could say, events like this. Uh, half-day events that we'd organised with the Wales Council for Voluntary Action and the uh, county voluntary councils that uh, sit with them. And we did three workshops from memory, one in Cardiff, one in Merthyr that I did, and one in North Wales. Um, so uh, we need to work with others to do that because uh, fundraising regulation sits within the wider... Uh, regulation of charities by the Charity Commission and as I mentioned earlier you've got all those other regulators some of whom are, are outside in the exhibition area and I think what we've learned over eight years of doing this very nearly is that um, the way regulation happens is increasingly not just one regulator doing something there are several of them potentially involved. Um, that's not only when you're dealing with sort of some quite tricky complaints, but when you're trying to set the, the groundwork. One of the nice things about being out here today was not only meeting a lot of people who've come to the, the convention to take part and to learn, but also an opportunity to check in with other regulators. And we had a very good conversation with the Information Commissioner earlier on. Uh, about some of the things they're trying to do that we need to, to learn about too. So you never stop, you never stop learning as a regulator, you never stop 
knowing that you need to get your messages out there. One of the challenges we face as a small organisation is working out how best to do that within budgets. Everybody has that, um, including us. Uh, and one of the questions we've been asked most often when we've been consulting, as we are at the moment on revisions to the code, is when we have the new one, how are we going to get it out there? Obviously, the full detail will be on the website, but can we do five-minute webinars on different bits of it? Can we do animations? All sorts of things. And so we do need to look at that to help us, help you, help colleagues uh, get it right and better. Thank you very much. Hi, I just wanted to commend Jared, whatever you've done in the, the fundraising regulator. I came from a corporate background, totally oblivious to the charity sector methods of operating. And uh, when I started leading my organization, the resources that you've got available had played an instrumental role in transforming the fundraising health of, of our organization. And it continues to because it's never ending and it's you'll never be 100%, but the more and more you do what's been helpful for me and might be helpful for other organizations or maybe as a service if you can offer is a, some sort of a fundraising audit of organizations to, to find the loopholes. What we tend to do is we do that audit through your resources and say, okay, these are the things that we've approved. This is where we missed the board. Now let's focus on these these things. So that that's something just as a feedback. I just wanted to appreciate because there is no resource available apart from yours in this sector that is so wholesome in the sense of okay, I understand after reading your code how the market works, how the fundraising things work. Uh, of course, reality is much different than what you've written in the code, so you have to balance between the between the two. Uh, as well. So that was just a comment, not a question, just wanted to appreciate it. My question is to Hassan, uh, probably from your, because you're, you're a guru when it comes to digital marketing, I've heard a lot about you from so many different organizations. I'm curious to know what, what, what throughout the organizations that you've worked, what's been your best ROAS, if it's to do with an organization or a campaign in particular? And the second question I have is, because there's so many digital avenues, you've got social media, you've got YouTube, you've got Google search, you've got display, and God knows so many more coming up and, and, and so on. Um, personally, I, because we're limited resource, I just focus on wherever the best return of investment is coming from. But I understand and I'm being told by people, you still need to be in those avenues where the returns are not coming from because eventually it funnels money through you if you're on display, if the people see you. YouTube, if they see your videos, eventually they're going to go to Google. But I just can't build the courage to waste money on places where it's not going to convert. Rather just put money where it's going to convert. Maybe you can advise on how best to choose the different avenues, do we just focus on the best ROI or do we also need to be in other avenues? Thank you very much. I did tell you that there is an obsession about ROI. <laughs> Thank you. ROAS is return on ad spend. Very much familiar with the marketing community and very much being asked by a board of director and trustee when they're giving money to marketers that they just spend it and there's no clue where the money is going. It's a tricky question. Very tricky. I mean, it really depends on the campaign. But in my <laughs> no, no, I mean, in some cases, 1 to 20, in some really? cases, 1 to 10, yeah, really depend. I, I think the, the, the major thing that we need to understand is not the activation part, but this technology part, as we speak now. I, I believe those days are now gone, where we say, okay, invest money upper funnel, mid or bottom funnel. It's all about backend technology. Do we even have a unified customer view available to see where they're coming and how they're engaging it, or what's the churn rate? That's the question, because there's so much opportunity to invest out there, and it really depends on the organization causes. And I usually used to ask all of the charity bosses, that what is your differentiation? Do we even have created any? Because for me, it seems to be everyone doing the same thing. Somebody has got orphan sponsorship, so, so as I've got orphan sponsorship. So, so yes, Ross was a difficult question. I think with the help of technology, this marketing technology, advertisement technology, and web technology, you will create your own business model, which will last for you. 
and that will be very, very unique for you, and that will not be very kind of easy to break by other. And these are quite, you know, usual things which you usually talk about. Okay, you know, invest in YouTube, etc. So, recently, uh, I attended some session in, 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 in YouTube. Uh, so, they have also developed the, you know, campaigns which can bring direct response. So technology has evolved. That's the reason I keep saying technology, technology, because these platforms are now clever enough to bring you results. But you need to choose the right partners. You need to choose the right battle, etc. So that's how now, you know, uh, this is a game now. And the gentleman also had a, um, another question around uh, the platforms and channels uh, that perform the best for Muslim charities. Yeah, I mean, again, from the half of the Customer consumer journey start from the Google search, 50%. Yeah. Every day, 8.5 billion searches going on. Google dominate 90% of the world market, English speaking, etc. So obviously, Google is the main partner in crime in, in terms of investment. Um, yes, there are other channels. There are other buying methods. Not necessarily you buy inventory through Google. There are other ad exchanges available whereby you can where you can go and buy a cheaper inventory. And they, and that's where I keep saying. To, Demand side technology and supply side technology need to understand. It's the modern market needs to understand technology first because then it will allow them to optimize the budgeting. So it's not straightforward per se. But again, marketing makes modeling uh, and looking at what your donor is looking for and how to build loyalty. So, yeah. Sorry, Thank it's you. a bit vague, but it's. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shazari. Any more questions? Perhaps that would be the last question we take before we wrap up. Thank you. Uh, really interesting uh, presentations. And uh, I have a double barreled question for, for Gerald. Um, and the first part of the question is um, Are you able to say, from your knowledge of the Muslim charity sector, areas where you think Muslim charities are doing outstandingly well? in terms of the effectiveness of their fundraising with an, uh, with an ethical basis? And are there areas where uh, maybe there's some questionable activity or a sense of must try harder as a sector? So that's one question. And the other is, in relation to your review of the code, do you start that process with a clear sense that there is a certain deficit as, as the world has changed? You know, issues that you already know you need to address. And on top of that, are there emerging concerns already coming from the consultation that you can tell us about? Okay, uh, two quite different questions there. Um, the first one, I think if you just think about one of the statistics that w was in Hassan's presentation just now about Islamic relief raising £415 a second back in the day before we had the technology that we have now, that's pretty impressive. And you know, I wouldn't know what the figure would be now for any current appeal, but it will probably be more than that. Um, and that's really interesting. And I think that sends a message that you, know, you can do it and you can do it at scale. Of course, that's very different to the sorts of challenges that a community-based organization will face where it's probably got to raise a sum of money to keep itself going to offer the services that it wants to provide to its community. And that's a struggle. Uh, Muslim charities are not alone in that. Um, so many charities across all communities, across different types of service are facing that at the moment. Uh, and there isn't uh, a magic wand that you can wave to make it all all right. Uh, so it's hard out there, um, probably more so than it's ever been. But, and the good, the good news is that community organisations are very resilient and they look to find new and different, better ways of doing things. I'm sure, bit by bit, even if it feels a bit daunting, a lot of them will start adopting the technologies, probably around the use of a mobile phone and what it enables people to do. If they just, even if they just want to donate a pound or five pounds, you know, it's there to do it. The world of open banking 
is there to help that, that through. And that will begin to make more of a difference for more organizations and more people. Um, the other part of that question, the more difficult part, about essentially do things go wrong? Yes, of course they do. Muslim charities are no more immune from that than any other charity in any other, you know, with any other community background. We seek to deal with those as we find them, as they come through, and seek to encourage organizations to engage with us and learn from what's happening. Um, it's really important they do that, because if they don't, things will continue to go wrong. And if that happens, that's where you get into trouble on reputation and people's willingness to give and support what you're doing. So if we come calling, because we let's say we've had a complaint, engagement and response is really important. Please do it, because my colleagues are there to try and solve a problem, not to um, come and you know beat people up because they've got something wrong. That's not what we're about, nor is it what the code is about. It's a learning thing. And on to the second part of your, your question. Too early to say what's coming out of the code consultation because it's got another six or seven weeks to run to December the 1st. And like all consultations, the people who respond to it will do so in the last few days before the consultation closes. I've done this for, you know, career over 30 or 40 years. It's always the same. The last day is when you get the stuff in and even after the last day. Uh, so can't really answer that at the moment. But the front part of your question about did we know what we wanted to change, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, some of that relates exactly to what Hassan was talking about in terms of making the code up to date for 2023, but beyond that, well, 2025 by the time it comes out, uh, but beyond that, because we don't want to revise the code all the time, the world of digital fundraising, the world of AI is changing all the time. A year ago, you would have hardly talked about AI, um, but now it's around. Sadly, there are some bad actors using it out there. Um, to mimic charity fundraising campaigns, whether they're large or small ones. So there's always that downside that you have to bear in mind. Um, so there's the whole way in which fundraising is changing that the code needs to be modernized for and our guidance that goes alongside it. We also knew, last, last word, that we wanted to take out of the code a number of things that are just clogging it up, that make it too complicated uh, too detailed. Uh, we don't need to repeat guidance that other other regulators have. So we'll slim it down and just say, if you want information about data protection, here's a link to the information commissioner. If you want to know about claiming gift aid from revenue and customs, here's the link to the gift aid site. Because those will be up to date where if we have it in the code, it may get out of date quickly. Hope that's helpful. Thank you very much, uh, panelists, for enlightening us today. Uh, this brings us to uh, the end of our session today. So let's leave here uh, with a renewed commitment uh, to ethical fundraising and uh, uh, trust and digital responsibility, ensuring that our philanthropy makes a positive impact on today's world. Thank you very much for participating. <laughs>